excited about this new series. Oh, I really believe with all my heart, as God's word always does, it's going to be life changing, life changing. So let's ask the Lord for help. Father God, we believe we receive your help as we go to the scripture, as we go to your word, your will on how to live life strong. We need your help, Lord. We just ask by the Holy Spirit that you breathe on the seed of your word. May it find its mark in our heart, grow up and produce lasting living fruit. All in Jesus' precious name, amen. We receive it. Thank you, Father. Faith moves, faith moves. Part one, I'm telling you, this is going to be life-changing, transformational. A few years ago, I was in a bookstore looking for a particular author who specialized in business, and I found his latest book. It was about $12, so I picked it up thinking, I'm gonna just go to the checkout and buy it. Suddenly, I believe I heard God's quiet voice. Why don't you ask me for this book, Stephen? It made me pause. I've got enough money to buy this book. Then I heard that quiet, Heavenly Father voice once again, ask me for the book. So I looked around to make sure that nobody was watching. I put my hand on the book and I said, God, you're my provider. So I, I ask you to give me this book. Amen. Looking around. Then I just walked away without the book. A couple of weeks go by and I, I forget all about the matter. Pam and I were at an event in town and an older woman who knew us, she came up to say hello. I'm so glad to see you both, she said. Pastor Stephen, I saw this book on sale a week ago, and I, I don't know why, but I thought you might like it, so I bought it for you. She pulls out of her purse a brand new copy of the exact book I asked God to get me. Now, I never told Pam or anybody that I did what I just told you about. Of course, I told this sweet lady what a great blessing it was to me, and I thanked her over and over and over. Now, here's what happened in that little $12 miracle. It wasn't about the 12 bucks. It was all about God communicating to me that he cares for even the smallest detail and desire of my life. I could have made it just a commercial, non-memorable transaction. That would have been meaningless days later. Or it could be a God connection story that I'm telling you about years later. Not only that, the precious lady who heard God's whisper sowed a great seed of blessing into my life. Do you think God views her obedience as only $12 worth? No, not hardly. God used her generosity to do something miraculous, I believe, in my life and in her life. And here we are years later talking about it. Somebody who struggles with the idea of faith might say, well, that's just petty. Stephen, that's petty, thinking God would be involved with something so insignificant as a book or a desire. To that person I ask, was Jesus being petty when he noticed the widow putting a half a cent into the offering? Is God petty when he oversees the unseen chromosome and proteins of an unborn baby? Was Jesus petty when he perceived that a sick woman touched his robe in a crowd of many, many people? Was that petty? Here's my challenge to you with this as we begin this exciting journey into the truth presented in this series called Faith Moves. Be open to discover the Bible truth that says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm sure you believe that pleasing God is kind of essential, right? If you can't believe God for a book, how can you believe God to help you get a job? If you can't believe God for the $12 things, how can you believe God for the priceless things? If you can't have faith move a book into your life, how can you have faith move a healing into your life? Would it be worthwhile to have faith move protection in and around your family, around your children, your grandchildren? Why, why believe to be free from depression and addiction if, if you can't believe God to give you a $12 book? Surely, you know a book is not worth near what forgiveness, mercy, peace, and what identity are worth. Tim Tebow, the famous NFL star, said this, being outspoken about my faith isn't just something that I do, it's who I am because my faith isn't just a little piece of my life, it is my life. Faith in God 
is his life. Is it your life? I know it's my life. Oh, get excited, my friend, because with God's word, we're going to undo traditional religious, nothing to do with truth thinking and replace it with God's holy word thinking. Did you know that God's word has the power to renew your mind, proving what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God? See, I like that word proving, proving in there. Faith moves, and when faith moves, faith proves that God is God and His Word is true. People are persuaded by results. Romans 2 verse 4 says, It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Results lead to repentance. Albert Einstein said this, People love chopping wood. In this activity, one immediately sees results. Hey, if you get more results chopping wood than praying to God, you need some Bible faith talk ASAP. Otherwise, you're in the same boat as the main character in the comedy, Nacho Libre, when he said, these eggs, these eggs are a lie, Stephen. They give me no eagle powers. They give me no nutrients. The guy put his faith in eating raw eggs to get supernatural results, and he got zero results, zero power. Look, We've all heard it said many times, even sung in hymns and tr Christian anthems, Christian anthems that faith moves mountains. It's even become a secular adage. I've heard people with no belief in God throw it into a conversation about business, politics, or family. It's like a knock on wood superstitious axiom that people say hoping it will be their four leaf clover or rabbit's foot just in case. Yeah, yeah, it looks like my wife's leaving me for drinking too much and gambling our savings away. And now the bank's foreclosing on our house and, and to top it all off, my dog has fleas and guess what? So do I. Oh well, faith moves mountains, right? Really? Really? Faith moves mountains. Are you kidding me? What kind of rabbit's foot theology is that? This is partly what we must address in this series called Faith Moves. Because the truth is, faith in God moves. It always moves. It always works. It never fails. It does overcome mountains. Faith in God. It overcomes. It accomplishes. It lifts. It turns. It heals. It restores. It appropriates. And on and on and on the great blessings go. Faith moves, my friend. Yes, faith moves. The critical component in this statement is qualifying what faith truly is. Everybody has some kind of faith. But Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But even atheists apply an excessive amount of faith in nothing to believe something evolved from the genius of nothing. Carl Sagan, famous author, astronomer, astrophysicist, and atheist, he said this, the cosmos is everything that was or is or ever will be. Wow. That's a lot of faith believing everything evolved from nothingness. John Clayton, on the other hand, the scientist and author, he said, since I was an atheist for many years and came to believe in God through my studies in science, it frustrated me to see students and parents who viewed faith and science as enemies. True and honest science, my friends, actually confirms the Bible over and over. It confirms the Bible kind of faith. C.S. Lewis, the famous writer, scholar, atheist turned Christian, said this, Atheists express their rage against God, although in their view, he does not exist. Well, you see, that's just feedback, screeching anti-faith feedback. On the other hand, I've watched Christians who say Jesus saved them from their sins and yet put all their faith in their own effort and their own goodness for building a family, a marriage, a business. Isn't that a strange faith contradiction? You believe you have no goodness to save yourself from your sins, but somehow you have enough goodness to merit God's will for your life here on earth? Erratic, isn't it? It's the spiritual sickness of double-mindedness that James 1 talks about when, when it says that those who waver in their faith will receive nothing from the Lord. Nothing. That's really strong talk. Nothing. And it's all dependent on faith. So my friend, we better know what real faith is because we can't afford no faith or counterfeit faith, a faith in nothingness, so to speak. We're on this amazing journey to learn to walk by faith because why? Faith moves. 
God's not a go nowhere kind of God. Absolutely not. Make no mistake about it. Having faith in God moves. It works. Are you getting excited yet? I know I am. This is for you. And the exciting thing is this. As you lay hold of the power force of faith in God, you'll be used as a source of blessing for others around you. You should know that I get really excited about you being blessed with truth, activated in faith, because it doesn't matter if you're seven, eight, or nine years old. It doesn't matter if you're 70, 80, or 90 years old. Faith moves, my friend. Faith moves. Billy Graham, the great preacher and evangelist, said this, if our faith isn't rooted in the Bible, see, he's talking about a Bible kind of faith. If our faith isn't rooted in the Bible, it will wither like a plant pulled out of the soil. He's absolutely correct. Many people have faith, but the genuine, authentic God kind of faith moves. It has proven results, efficacy. No matter how good the marketing says an anti-cold medicine is, if people see that it has no efficacy when someone's sick, only deceived and confused customers will end up buying it. Here's how God says real faith, true faith is sourced. Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is absolute spiritual law. It's one of the big faith scriptures. It's short, but to the point, and it's powerful. Someone once said, faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but has the power to connect you to what you need. Look, I say it connects you to who you need, God. Having God's word on knowing, going, and growing in faith helps us lock and load. If we don't have this basic principle to source true faith in God, we succumb to the deceit running wild, even in many of our Bible colleges. Without God's word, we settle for faith that's subjective and therefore a God that's subjective. Designer morality is the convenience of foolish thinkers. Romans 1 says, these thinkers repress and hinder the truth and make it inoperative. You don't want that. Thank God that's not us. No way. We love the straight edge of God's truth. So let's do the opposite of these God haters in Romans 1 and let's allow faith to rise up as we hear God's word on this matter. Look at this scripture where Jesus is speaking to the disciples after they witness him using faith. They're stunned. They are absolutely shocked, amazed at what Jesus did using words of faith. In Mark 11, Jesus and the boys, they're out for a walk when he sees a fig tree off in the distance and he's hungry. The Lord's hungry. He wants a little something to eat. So he walks over to the tree and he finds a bunch of leaves, but zero fruit, no fruit. Then he says to the tree, not to the person, not to anything else, but Jesus talks to the tree and he says, no one ever shall eat fruit from you again. Basically, he uses faith to move the tree out of existence. They continue their journey to Jerusalem, do some business there, and then the next day they return along the same road, same path. The disciples notice that the fig tree is completely withered away to its roots. Peter says, Master, look, the fig tree which you doomed has withered away. Jesus punctuates the moment for the disciples and all of us with this life statement of powerful truth. We must, listen to me, you've got to hear this and you must understand this principle he lays out. Mark 11, verse, starting at verse 22 to 24. And Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Verse 24, for this reason I'm telling you, says Jesus, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted or that you receive it and you will get it. How do you feel about being able to get it in life? Have you ever been in a classroom or on a job and just felt like, I don't get it? Or felt like you've worked so hard to accomplish something, maybe you've just worked so hard at love, at marriage, at family, and yet you're feeling like, I don't get it. After all this sacrifice, after all this investment, we're falling apart, I don't get it. Maybe it's a healing or a miracle for your health. Maybe your loved one, and you feel like you, you'd do anything for them to be able to just 
get it. It's that critically important. Well, my friend, Jesus is trying to tell us that faith moves. Faith moves so that you can get it. Jesus starts the sequence of these three verses with, he said, have faith in God. And then he lands it on, you will get it. I've heard some Christians talk about this text and actually be offended with it. You know, when you don't get it, when your experience is one of not getting the outcome of your faith, you look for a way of escaping the pain that you feel. I understand that. The temptation is to defer responsibility. If it's God's fault, maybe it's some preacher's misinterpretation or God's will that you don't get it, well, then maybe you feel not so helpless, like a short-term spiritual Tylenol, but you and I both know the sharp pain comes back because it's hopeless to live without real faith, real faith answers. Jesus doesn't want that for us, though. Jesus came to give us life, to give it to us more abundantly. Be encouraged because Jesus said, you will get it. That's what the master said. Yes, you'll get it, my friend. Here's where being wrong is so exciting. If faith truly does what Jesus said it does, and you feel like you've used faith, but it didn't work, well, maybe you've done it wrong, and that's okay. Is that a possibility? It's not an insult to be wrong. It's not a judgment like you're an evil person and God doesn't care about you. That's a lie. God deeply loves you. And he's promised you righteousness, which is right standing with him through his son, Jesus. So the absolute truth is God's not withholding good things from you or miracle power from you. Faith works. Faith moves when it's activated biblically. Faith moves, but it must be employed properly. It's a powerful force and you must know how to turn on the engine, so to speak like drinking water out of a glass, right? You've got to put your mouth on the near side and not on the wrong side, right? Because even with a glass, things will get messed up. Isn't that correct? Think of Jesus' second coming, his triumphant return. It's a big deal. So what do you think will be the number one thing on Jesus' mind? Do you think Jesus will care about how many church buildings there are on earth? Do you think his top priority will be to see who loves the most? Like Peter, who's loving the most? Because love is pretty important. It's a big deal. Remember, Peter wanted to impress Jesus with his love. And he said, I love you more than all these others. The problem came a few hours later when Peter's faith was tested as Jesus was arrested. He folded like a cheap suit. He was weak in faith and so his love failed. Even a little servant girl had him running so scared he abandoned Jesus to the mob. Let's see what Jesus is looking for in the moment of his return. Luke 18, verse 8. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is Jesus talking. It doesn't matter if it's the second coming or a quick prayer asking God for help. The question is the same. Do you have faith? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you love me, but do you trust me? God's asking. When you love someone, it's about what you're doing. It's about your ability to love, to give. But when you have faith in someone, it's about them, their quality. It's about them being trustworthy. When Peter told Jesus he loved Jesus, he was saying, see how good I am, Lord? I love you. Later, when he denied Jesus at the mock trial, Peter was saying, I really don't believe in you. Sure, I said I believed you were the son of God, but seeing you suffer makes me doubt you. Peter was weak in faith. He was faithless. He was unfaithful. And that made his love pretty useless and worthless. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many a man proclaims his own loving kindness and goodness, but a faithful man who can find. If you want to build a relationship, a marriage, a family, a life, a home, you better get this truth in your heart quick. Faith moves. Faith moves forward, onward, upward. Yes, faith is the container that moves love year after year, decade after decade, anniversary after anniversary to build an Abraham Sarah love story, a Boaz Ruth love story. That's what you want. To all my wonderful people hoping, believing, praying to be married someday, you better know that love is the greatest. But listen to this. 
faith is the first and the foremost. If you don't have faith, you will never be able to retain the love. A diamond needs a setting to move through life on your finger, right? Faith moves, faith moves love. No faith, that's called being unfaithful, and that is a tragedy for any marriage or family. Do you want a great business, a successful career? Get God's faith stirred up in your heart because this is the force of life that produces results. Faith moves. As they say, hope is not a strategy, and yet hope is essential to vision. On the other hand, faith moves the business plan. Yes, it moves hope into a strategy of belief, small steps of obedience to further the vision and is the key to unlocking doors of impossibility. Faith does that, faith moves. If you feel stuck and nothing's moving, then you can discern that you're not using faith or not using it correctly at least. That's good to come to that conclusion. If you're honest about where you're at, well then you can repent, you can course correct. On the other hand, you can't repent if you believe you do everything right and God's to blame. Never allow condemnation to come in, but get excited when you hear God's truth and realize that you were wrong. If God's correcting you, Hebrews 12, 6 says, that means you're a true child of God. You can only be a child of God by faith, no other way. Yes, once again, faith moves. Faith moves you into God's family. In faith, you begin to realize the characteristic of true faith is that it moves, it moves. It moves mountains, it moves obstacles, it moves blessings, it moves your children, it moves the hand of God, it moves angelic forces assigned to protect you and your family. Maybe you're thinking moving a mountain requires faith the size of a mountain. Well, look at Matthew 17, verse 20. So Jesus said to them, if you have faith as a mustard seed, that's tiny, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. A mustard seed is tiny. It's one to two millimeters. That's, that's like a fraction of a small apple seed. I like the Lord's blunt assessment of nothing shall be impossible for you. And it has nothing to do with the size of your faith seed. Jesus said, if you had faith, you will say, that's right. It doesn't matter if the faith is the size of a mustard seed. If you have faith, you will say. What have you been saying? Proverbs 18, 21 says, there's death and life in the power of the tongue. They who indulge in it will eat the fruit of it for either death or life. So what have you been saying? Well, Pastor Stephen, I, I say a lot of crazy stuff, but, but that doesn't matter, does it? It's not like it's a faith thing. Jesus said, out of our mouth proceeds the abundance of our heart. Your heart expresses your beliefs. Even if you're telling lies, your heart's saying, well, that's where my confidence is. Proverbs 18 says you're confessing death or life because you're activating faith for either death or life. Make no mistake, faith moves. Where's your faith? Who's your faith in? There's a chapter in the Bible that's been nicknamed the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. And it gives us this inspiring sequence of Hall of Famers that use their faith to truly live life strong, to overcome, and to see miracles to show up here on earth. Listen to just a few of these honorable mentions from that chapter. Moved by faith, Adam and Eve's son Abel pleased God with his offering, and he still speaks today. Enoch didn't die, but was moved to heaven, and it was recorded that he pleased God with faith. Noah, you remember him, used faith to build a giant ark, save his family and all the animals, and became an heir of God. Abraham and Sarah, they were moved by faith to a new land of promise and blessing from God, leaving what was familiar, going into what they didn't know. It says, because of faith, Abraham and Sarah in their 90s conceived and had a beautiful baby boy. Moved by faith, Moses' family protected him from the king's decree to kill all of the Hebrew babies. Moved by faith, Moses turned his back on Egypt and found his purpose as a leader when he became an adult. Moses used faith to institute the famous Passover and to cross the Red Sea on dry land with all the children of Israel. Because of faith, the walls of Jericho fell down and the nation of Israel moved up. Moved by faith, Rahab the prostitute became a spy and helped save her family from death. Gideon used faith to defeat an army without number with 300 guys with flashlights and bugles. 
David killed Goliath with faith, not a slingshot. Daniel closed the lion's mouths using faith. Faith subdued kingdoms. It obtained promises, blessings. It administered justice for the weak. Faith provided escape from weapons, turned frailty into strength, and it raised up the dead. That's what faith does. And I love how the Hall of Fame chapter lands. It says this, because God has us in mind and something better and greater in view for us, for you. My friend, God Almighty has something better and greater in view for you. And the just shall live by faith. Walk by faith, talk by faith, receive by faith, please God by faith. You cannot truly love God without faith in God. As my grandfather used to say, that's putting the cart before the horse. With faith, nothing will be impossible for you. Doesn't that seem like cool, refreshing water to your soul? God's word that faith makes it so nothing will be impossible for you. Do you qualify? Maybe that's a great concern to you, but Jesus specifically said in Mark 11, verse 23, whoever says, King James says, whosoever, Whoever says and believes, it will be done for him. Faith moves. Faith moves mountains, fig trees, giants, nations, hearts, and yes, even books. Maybe it bothered you that I use faith to get a simple book, but I realize I need to work on my faith in God for everything. I need to practice it. I need him for the big stuff, so why would I assume I don't need God for the little stuff? Sometimes the things you can't see are far more consequential than the things you can see. If you can't use faith for joy and peace, how can you use faith for your marriage or your business? We've got to keep walking by faith, exercising our faith in God. Don't live stuck atrophying in the mud of unbelief. You have faith in God and you know faith moves. Let's pray. Pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I have faith in you. I believe on you. Come into my heart. You're the Son of God. You died on the cross for me. Rose up from the grave. Now you're seated on the throne of heaven. Forgive me of all my sins. Help me live for you. Fill me with your Spirit. Give me your hope and strength. Nothing is impossible for me. Say that again. Nothing is impossible for me. In your name, Jesus, I I release my faith. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.